I would like now to turn to MUSD moving forward together, MUSD COVID-19 update 2021-22. So this year has, as we said at the beginning, has really been an exceptional year. It's been an opportunity for us to begin to feel what it's like to be in each other's presence without a screen between us. And while it's very joyful and exciting, there are also many challenges that we are navigating together. So tonight, my report will give us some of the highlights and opportunities, as well as some of the struggles and challenges. First, some of the excitement, exciting, challenge, exciting highlights. So we are back in person. And as I walked down Escuela Parkway on the first day of school, I realized that we had nearly half of our student body on that street at that time. That was a pretty amazing feeling. The other amazing thing was the first day back for all of our team members gathered on the football field and the opportunity to be in their physical presence once again knowing all of the ways that we've stretched, the ways that we have uh, suffered, as well as those opportunities where we found our resilience. It really was a, quite a remarkable experience and one that uh, left me short of words. As you heard from Mira, we have our MUSD Middle College High School in action now, it's open. It's something we've been planning and talking about for about six years. And now the doors are open and the students are there. And something I'm beginning to recognize about our students at Milpitas uh, Community College High School is that they are definitely stepping out there as leaders because I've also heard from a couple of your uh, colleagues, a couple of your classmates already asking me about things such as when do we start COVID testing and what are you doing to keep us safe? So I really appreciate that. And I look forward to watching all of the uh, work that you do together as learners. Our Randall World Languages School, another project that we've talked about for many years, at last has a new welcoming drop-off area, a brand new multi-use room. It also has a center for community and family. And it is also another area of um, excitement. It also presents some challenges uh, around uh, the crosswalk situation, which we will, which I've talked with the chief of police about, as well as the city manager uh, who has the traffic engineer um, over there to look and see what we can do to remedy the situation with the crosswalk that used to be there between Perry and the school front and is no longer there. We also have our new MUSD Educate Everywhere virtual pathway, which is exciting. And you're going to hear about it a couple of times throughout the meeting. In my report, I will go into a little more detail about where we are with MUSD Educate Everywhere virtual pathway. And later, our executive uh, directors will share where we want it to go uh, at a very high level. And we also have our match dose portables. This is, while both exciting, it is also a challenge. We expected to have a phase of match dose completed by now that would house the nearly almost double student population. It was at 262 last June. It is now at, I believe it's 484. And so we have a bank of portables that are on site to house our first graders and kindergartners. And right in the middle of it all is construction going on. And fortunately, the classrooms are pretty soundproof. But if you step outside, you're going to hear a lot of construction. Our Russell and Milpitas High School have new start times as a result of education code changes. And uh, for the high school level, students are to start at 8.30 or later. And the staff determined that they wanted to start at 8.30. And that is by contract. Uh, the staff, by a two-thirds vote, has to determine 
what its schedule will look like. And then Russell, on the other hand, they changed from 8.30 to 8 a.m. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we have half of our student population going down to Escuela between the hours of uh, 7.45 and 8.30. It's quite a, it is still presents itself as a challenge and I look forward to our MUSD Innovation Campus opening because that'll take about 500 students off of the campus and that will help to alleviate traffic as well as ultimately when our virtual pathway opens and some of the other uh, innovations that we are looking at of how students can learn in different ways using internships and applied learning so that they're learning beyond the classroom walls. And certainly as we look to schedules, there may be something in what we learned last year about doing block scheduling that might also help with the student learning as well as maybe with traffic in the future. Another exciting thing is music classes are back. And did you know that there's such a thing as a mask for a musical instrument? So I learned that today in my superintendent's meeting. Uh, one of the superintendents said that her school district has masks for the instruments so that the students can practice inside. I quickly emailed our music director and asked, do you know about these masks for instruments? And she said, yes, as a matter of fact, I just emailed the department executive directors yesterday asking if we could get the mask for the instruments so it could be back inside. And so they're in process, Emily. <laughs> so that's exciting news because uh, then when it, uh, one of these days when we start to have some rain, our students will be able to practice inside and chorus is already uh, practicing inside with masks on. I'd like to take uh, some of the highlights of our MUSD virtual pathway program. We started planning this last spring and we determined based on the experience that our teachers and learners had and our parents and caregivers that for students in TK, K and one, we really uh, believe that the best opportunity for them to learn in those first years is in person. And so it was for this reason that we did not plan to have TK, K, and one in our virtual pathway option. The other reason, uh, main reason we developed the virtual pathway is because we found that there are a number of learners who really flourished in the online learning opportunity. And so we wanted to develop that and make it uh, possible for them. And we gave everybody a deadline of June 25th to let us know that they wanted their child in the virtual pathway. So by June 25th, we had 215 students, as you could see. We had eight teachers and we had uh, 124 elementary and about 91 secondary students all ready to go. And then July 7th, our legislatures, hearing from many people throughout uh, the state of California that they were concerned about having their students in person and wanted an option. And while legislation is such that we must have our students in person five full days a week. It doesn't allow for uh, the hybrid learning that we were doing last year in many respects, again, because of what um, pediatricians and other researchers found in the experience of learners who were learning uh, virtually or in hybrid. It impacted their social emotional development a great deal, as well as and some students uh, created a greater chasm in their learning. And so in order to remedy that so that those parents who have children that they're concerned about for their health in light of COVID, AB 130 uh, says that we must offer uh, independent study. In our case, it's a virtual pathway to students in TK through 12th grade. So we had to quickly scramble and uh, make it so that we could have TK, K and one students make sure our parents in those grade levels knew that it was an option and then posted for all on our website. The other aspect of AB 130 is that any parent or caregiver whose child is in independent studies for long-term or in our case, virtual pathway, once they decide that they want their child to go back to in-person, we have to place that child in an in-person classroom within five days. So you can imagine, and we are experiencing 
the effect of this um, revolving door of kids going in and out. And you see that we are now currently, as of August 24th today, at 444 students. The bulk of them are in elementary. You see the secondary pretty much stayed the same since July, only growing by uh, about 20 kids. We have 43 students on a wait list because we do not have enough staffing. We have our teachers on special assignment who are pulled off of their work that they normally are doing to support the district in areas like instructional technology and English language development. And they are in the virtual pathway. We also have some long-term subs who are filling in. So our virtual pathway is experiencing some challenges. Another aspect uh, that has changed is that the governor gave a directive that all those who either work or volunteer or act as board members in a school setting must provide proof of vaccination. And if they don't have vaccination, they must, uh, must have COVID testing weekly at least. And so I would like to share that 50% of our employees and our volunteers uh, have thus far indicated uh, and provided the vaccination certification, including our board members. And uh, as of June 25th, just for comparison, we had 88% of our student of our employees self report that they were vaccinated. So we're just waiting for them all to upload their proof of vaccination and that number will increase. The deadline is September 2nd. So superintendent for clarification, the 50% is, could you, could you restate? What yes, that 50 as is? to date, 50% of our employees, including um, that includes volunteers who are regularly volunteering and we don't really have any uh, aside from as board members, in a sense, you're volunteers because the compensation that you receive, essentially, I think we talked about how that kind of covers gas money. But um, all of the board members have completed the form. And so by September 2nd, every employee has to complete the form. Now, if they don't have a vaccination, they don't plan to be vaccinated, until the date that they are, they have to have weekly COVID testing. So all of those who are not providing us with vaccination certification will have to do and are doing weekly um, testing. And I would like to just state for uh, the record that all of those at the dais today have had uh, antigen test either today or yesterday. And um, I'll let the board members share if they've been vaccinated or not, um, because it is personal. But I can tell you that because all of us tested negative, I can say we were all negative. Looking at Santa Clara County and the vaccination rates, uh, you see here that our county is quite high in the number of people who have been vaccinated. It's anywhere from 80% of full vaccination to 86, almost 87% have received one dose. And 16 and older in Santa Clara County are 82, almost 82.5% vaccinated. Well, I don't have any documentation because it's, uh, in a sense, sort of privileged information for superintendents. I can tell you that the, in the city of Milpitas, our 12 to 18 year olds have an extremely high vaccination rate, which mirrors what you see up there. And we will be offering again, another vaccination clinic on our campuses as we did back in July. On this slide, you see that those who are vaccinated compared to those who are unvaccinated have a much smaller rate of uh, case rate of receiving COVID and, and receiving COVID is the wrong word, of having COVID. And I can also tell you that it's less than 1.2% uh, of those who are vaccinated who may contract COVID are hospitalized. So for those who are vaccinated, if you do, and, uh, if you do contract COVID, 
it is highly unlikely that you will be hospitalized. So we encourage you to be vaccinated if you aren't yet. And as soon as our students 12 years and under are able to be vaccinated, we will certainly have vaccination clinics available on our school sites. So what I'd like to show you on this slide is what we like to call a KWL, what I know, what I want to know, and what I learned. If you go to our COVID resource page, which you go to our website here and you see where it says up on the menu bar, COVID novel coronavirus, that's where you'll find all of the resources, what we know, and also um, what has to happen in case you are notified that you need to do a modified quarantine. I will share with you that our dashboard that we maintain for this school year, you have to go to the scroll down and you'll see that we are maintaining a dashboard for our positive cases. And thus far we have 19 students and one staff member with COVID. Now there are a number of steps that we have to take in order to isolate that uh, person with COVID and also prevent it from spreading elsewhere. And there's something called a modified quarantine, which has created uh, some uncertainty amongst parents in particular and caregivers. And that is, what do I do if I get notified that my child was a close contact? So again, today I meet weekly with the county superintendents and with the public health department. This was a discussion um, so that we as superintendents could uh, respond to our team members as well as our parents and caregivers to let you know that if you receive a notice that says that um, you were in close contact, it doesn't mean that you need to keep your child at home. As a matter of fact, if everybody is wearing a mask, it helps to prevent the spread. Uh, not as good as a vaccine, but it's the next best thing. And again, as I said at the beginning, it's very important for students to be in person for the most part. And yes, there are some students who learn better when they are able to do it virtually. But for the vast majority of our elementary students, in person is the best way to help us and not only catching up those areas that they uh, might be behind in or they might have not have had experience in, it also really helps with that trauma that we heard our young students talking about at the beginning of the board member, at the beginning of the board meeting. The trauma in some respects comes from isolation and the unknown. So we ask that when you receive a notice that your child may have been um, in the vicinity of a person with COVID or may actually have been a close contact of somebody with COVID, please do follow the modified quarantine and know that we are following it as well. And it requires us to test twice within five days, all of those who were close contact. And we have not yet had what would be considered an outbreak by the county. An outbreak would be three persons in the same classroom who have COVID and it's all related to each other. We don't have that yet. Now, I must also share with the board and with the community, if you have not already heard, that it is very likely that we are going to have, continue to have an increase in cases because of the travel that um, people experienced during the summer. And also because uh, for those people who haven't been vaccinated, as you can see, the case rate is high. So what happens is once uh, the variant uh, finds nobody else that it can infect because either you've been vaccinated, you're all wearing masks um, or you have it, it, it dies down almost as quickly as it comes. In fact, a, a person who is working with a COVID, a virologist at UCSF said a couple of weeks ago in a report that I heard that it's almost like the hurricane, like a hurricane. It comes in quickly and then leaves just as quickly in communities where there's high vaccination rates. So Melpitas, 
We should be proud. We've been masking and we're getting the vaccines. We're doing what we can to protect each other and most importantly, to protect our children. So in summary, in order to make sure our students are in-person learning and in order to keep everybody safe, let's get vaccinated, wear our masks, do those health checks, and we'll keep learning and moving together. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan.